Biological information, positive selection. We've been discussing the book, Biological Information, New Perspectives, edited by a number of different people, um, published by World Scientific Publishing. Should have been Springer, but that's a story for earlier. Uh, published in 2013, so relatively recent. Um, recording the proceedings of a symposium held in May and June of 2011 at Cornell University. Not sponsored by Cornell, uh, but uh, uh, John Sanford is a professor at Cornell. And uh, available on the internet for free. You can get it in hard copy. I got it in hard copy, not so much because I needed it, as because I wanted to give a donation to the company that printed it. And I think that that's a, a worthy motive for those of you who have that feeling and have that money. <coughs> the book starts out with a general introduction, which we went through, information theory and biology, which we've also gone through, biological information and genetic theory, uh, theoretical molecular biology, and then finally, biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Note self-organizational complexity theory does not have directly to do with intelligent design, so this is not an intelligent design book, but it is a book that's highly skeptical of the current Darwinian, neo-Darwinian synthesis. And we're in the uh, chapter on biological information and genetic theory, or the section. And <coughs> the name of the chapter is Selection Threshold Severely Constrains Capture of Beneficial Mutations. In other words, positive selection isn't that good. It's written by John Sanford, uh, John Baumgardner, who's, um, one of whose expertise is in computer science, and Wesley Brewer. And uh, there's a little more information about them. Um, the abstract is divided, as some abstracts are nowadays, into sections. Background, in a companion paper, careful numerical simulation was used to demonstrate that there is a quantifiable selection threshold below which low-impact deleterious mutations escape purifying selection and therefore accumulate without limit. In that study, we developed the statistic ST sub D, um, which is the midpoint of the transition zone between selectable and unselectable deleterious mutations. It's the point at which 50% of the uh, anti-selected material keeps showing up anyway. Um, we showed that under most natural circumstances, ST sub D values are surprisingly high, such that the large majority of all deleterious mu mutations are un unselectable. Does a similar selection threshold exist for beneficial mutations? Methods, as in our companion paper, we here employ what we call, uh, what we describe as genetic accounting. To quantify the selection threshold, this time the beneficial selection threshold, for beneficial mutations, and we show how various biological factors combine to determine its value. Results in all experiments that employ biologically reasonable parameters, we observe high ST sub B values and a general failure of selection to preferentially amplify the large majority of beneficial mutations. High impact beneficial mutations strongly interfere with selection for or against all low impact mutations. Conclusions. A selection threshold exists for beneficial mutations similar in magnitude to the selection threshold for deleterious ones. But the dynamics of that threshold are different. Our results suggest that for higher eukaryotes, that's uh, animals with uh, a nucleus or um, organisms with the nucleus, including plants and animals um, and fungi. 
minimal values for st sub b are in the range of 10 to the minus fourth to 10 to the minus third. It appears very likely that most functional nucleotides in a large genome have fractional contributions to fitness much smaller than this. This means that, given our current understanding of how natural selection operates, we cannot explain the origin of the typical functional nucleotide. Okay. Introduction, it will hark back to the previous paper. Mueller first argued that at a certain point, at a certain point, low impact mutations should be outside the reach of natural selection. Mueller's primary concern was that accumulation was the accumulation of deleterious mutations. Later, Kimura used rigorous mathematical analysis to validate this idea. While Kimura initially described such mutations as neutral, Oda argued that such mutations should be more accurately ter be termed nearly neutral, and Kimura eventually acknowledged this. Again, their focus was on deleterious mutations. It's the same thing, as we will see, is true for beneficial mutations. Kondrashov described how low-impact mutations, which are essentially unselectable, create a profound evolutionary par paradox because de deleterious mutations should accumulate continually, causing continual fitness decline. Lynch et al. and Higgins and Lynch showed that accumulation of low-impact deleterious mutations should be a key fact factor in the extinction process. More recently, Lowe demonstrated that the accumulation of nearly neutral deleterious mutations in just the human mitochondrial chromosome could theoretically eventually lead to extinction. In a companion paper, numerical simulation was used to clearly show that the problem of con continuously accumulating low-impact deleterious mutations is indeed a very real problem. We showed that under any given biological circumstances, there is a definitive selection threshold for mutation fitness effect, and mutations with a fitness effect below this threshold accumulate largely unhindered by the selection process. We further showed that under realistic conditions, this selection threshold is surprisingly high, in the range of 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 3. Those findings indicate that, the most, that most deleterious mutations should be unselectable confirming Kondrashov's paradox and reinforcing long-standing concerns about genetic load. One widely cited mechanism which might counteract the accumulation of slightly deleterious mutations is the concept of compensating mutations, as first proposed by Oda and later expanded by others. Oda proposed that for each accumulating deleterious mutation, there is somewhere else in the genome a beneficial mutation that has more or less equal but opposite compensating effect on fitness. A little worse here, a little better here, it's a wash. This could possibly be happening, this could not possibly be happening independent of selection because we know that deleterious mutations strongly outnumber beneficial mutations. So this would have to be a post selection effect. Therefore, the hypothesis of compensating mutations would be only conceivable if there could be effective selection for equal but opposite beneficial mutations. This appears problematic because the deleterious mutations are accumulating precisely because their fitness effects are too small to be selectable. Logically, one might suspect that beneficial mutations with fitness effect values of similar amplitude would be equally unselectable. This raises important questions. Is there a selection threshold for beneficial mutations? Under biologically reasonable circumstances, how large might such a selection threshold be? What are the biological implications of such a threshold? Kimura attempted to quantify the threshold for a selection breakdown. His calculations focused on deleterious mutations and considered the influence of only one source of biological noise on the rate of mutation fixation that of gametic sampling. It is obvious, however, that there are other sources of biological noise besides gametic sampling. Except under strict probability selection, for which transmission of a gamete to the next generation is in strict proportion to the relative fitness of the parent, each of these other sources of noise should influence the th selection threshold. <coughs> Lynch, for example, noted the small population size 
large nucleotide numbers between crossovers, and high mutation levels all synergistically reduce the eff efficiency of natural selection. To study some of these biological factors and to quantify how they affected the selection threshold, we have implemented a numerical simulation strategy using a program named Mendel's Accountant. Mendel's Accountant, or Mendel, is freely available at the website listed. This numerical approach enables us to explore the biological complexity of the mutation selection process as it actually occurs in nature in a way not before possible. As early as 1964, Miller called for more research aimed at better understanding the selection threshold problem. He stated there comes a level of advantage, however, that is too small to be effectively seized upon by selection, its voice being lost in the noise, so to speak. This level would necessarily differ greatly under different circumstances, genetic, ecological, etc. But this is a subject that has yet been subject to little analysis, although deserving of it. The companion paper does the very analysis which Mueller felt was needed for deleterious mutations. The goal of this second paper is to describe the parallel analysis relative to the factors that affect the selectability of beneficial mutations. And uh, <coughs> we'll go through some of the results. Conditions allowing optimal selection for beneficial mutations. To better understand the selection threshold phenomenon, we employed the same methodology described in our companion paper, conducting numerical simulation experiments using Mendel's accountant. The details of how Mendel's accountant works and how we conducted our experiments are given in the methods section at the end of this paper. Now, just a little note there. Uh, these yellow dots are mine. I'm not going to read the entire paper. Uh, where you see that, that means that there's material missing. If you want to read the rest of it, uh, go back to the original article, which again is available free on the web. We first conducted experiments to see if there are any parameter settings that allowed selection to amplify beneficial allele frequencies across the full <coughs> range of mutational fitness effects. We found that even, even under idealized selection conditions and zero biological noise, perfect selection for low impact beneficial mutation never occurs. This, by the way, is in contrast to deleterious mutations where if you select the uh, factors correctly, you can actually get to where no deleterious mutations occur. In this regard, beneficial mutations have a distinctly worse selection threshold problem than the new deleterious mutation because given the same biological parameters that allow deleterious mutations to be selected away, a large fraction of beneficial mutations remain immune to selective amplification. They're just too small. Even with high selection intensity, minimal selection interference, zero environmental variation, and perfect truncation selection, we observed a significant ST sub B as seen in figure one. And there's figure one. You'll notice that um, the selectability tends to be very close to one. Uh, the difference, some of the difference here is due to random error. Uh, until you get about to e to the 10 to the 6, and then it starts to rapidly climb. And this is an exponential curve. Um, this, by the way, this 2 happens to correspond to the 1 half for deleterious mutations. That is to say, at two, you get twice the number of beneficial mutations being multiplied um, as you do the, the wild type. Whereas for the other one, you get half of the beneficial, or, or pardon me, of the deleterious mutations that you do of the wild type. Figure one displays the accumulation of beneficial mutations as a function of mutational fitness effect relative to the case of zero selection. Mutational fitness effect, shown on the x-axis, using the logarithmic scale, ranges from minimum non-neutral mutational value up to maximal fitness effect. We define the minimal non-neutral mu mutation value as the reciprocal of the function on genome size. In this case, we're considering a human population and assuming only 10% of the genome is functional. Note that 
per some of our previous discussion, that is a very conservative assumption. Each bin represents a fitness effect interval, and the height of the bin re reflects the accumulation ratio of that class of mutations relative to the case of no selection. A height of 1.0, therefore, corresponds to the level of accumulation that occurs when a selection is entirely ineffective. In other words, a mutation's frequency is influenced only by genetic drift. We define the beneficial selection threshold as the fitness effect value for which the distribution has a value 2.0. That is to say, for the first fitness effect interval, which displays twice the accumulation ratio expected in the absence of selection. <coughs> this is in contrast to the deleterious selection threshold. I just lost something there. Um, this is in contrast to the deleterious selection threshold, which is defined as the fitness effect where mutation accumulation is half that which is expected in the absence of selection. You get ha um, uh, twice of, of it is going to be the wild type. The beneficial selection threshold value can be seen visually in figure one as the intersection point of the upper dotted line with the mutation distribution at 1.34 times 10 to the minus 6. Let's just take a, another quick look at that. Um, it's where this line here intersects the rising line of Mendel's accountant. To the right of this selection threshold value, the height of all bins increases rapidly because selection is highly effective in amplifying beneficial mutation frequency in this area. This method of representing the accumulating mutations is very useful, yet fails to convey the actual number of mutations in each bin because the bin height represents merely a ratio of the actual mutation count versus the mutation count expected in the case of zero mu selection. It is important to realize that the mutation distribution is approximately exponential so that the bins out on the far left, that is low impact mutations, contain the vast majority of beneficial mutations while the bins on the right, that is high impact mutations, even when filled, represent very few mutations, actual total. Even in this idealized selection experiment, we actually observed that 92.7% of all beneficial mutations lay below the selection threshold. There will be occasional high impact beneficial mutations that arise beyond the range of mutation effects of this experiment, that is above 0 0.001, but they will be so rare as to have very little effect on the fraction of mutations which are not selectable. Although they do eventually have their effect. Effective environmental variance. In the preceding experiment, parameters were chosen to maximize selection efficiency without any regard for biological realism. This is the best we can do. Two of the most unrealistic aspects of that experiment were the use of truncation selection and the assumption of zero environmental variation. To explore the influence of environmental variation, we conducted a series of experiments using identical parameters except that we increased the level of environmental variance, quantified in terms of fitness heritability, the ratio of genotypic variance to total phenotypic variance. That is, tall genes versus how tall the person actually is. And some of which has to do with what kind of food they ate and things like that that have nothing to do with the genes. Uh, <coughs> figure two shows three cases with fitness heritabilities of 0 0.4, 0 0.04, and 0 0.004. And, uh, as we'll find out, the 0.004 is actually a literature value. Resulting STB values were 1.69 times 10 to the minus 6, 6.29 times 10 to the minus 6, and 1.4 times 10 to the minus 5th, respectively. That is, here's, here is the, the value. The value without, uh, with heritability equals 1 was the original that we saw probably uh, out about here and as you can see the the less heritability you have the harder it is to select beneficial mutations 
to where beneficial mutations have to have an effect greater than uh, 10 to the minus fifth on, on the actual survivability of the organism. As can be observed, higher levels of environmental variance led to higher ST sub B levels and a larger no selection zone. The, the lowest fitness heritability value we used is from Kimura and is in keeping with the enormous impact environmental variance has on total phenotypic fitness under natural conditions. That particular heritability value yielded an ST sub B approximately one order of magnitude higher than the zero environmental variance case. So it makes it harder to select if there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between the gene and the actual appearance of the organism itself. And we observed that in that instance, 98.8% .8 of the beneficial mutations fell below the selection threshold. That is to say we're selecting about 1.2% of the actual beneficial mutations. Rest of them you can't tell. They don't get selected. Introduction of probability into the selection process. In another set of experiments, series of experiments, we examined how much more realistic how, mu how more realistic modes of selection impact the beneficial selection threshold. Figure three contrasts our first experiment, which employed truncation selection, to more realistic cases employing partial truncation and probability selection. Figure three compares the results from the case shown in figure one, red, with identical runs, but only partial truncation green or probability selection blue. And here's our figure, and you will notice it. This is the red, this is our original. This is what happens when something is selected in proportion to the probability that it actually makes the organism more fertile, if you please. And you'll notice that all the way out to 0 0.001, uh, the effect is basically zero. Um, this, some of this is statistical noise. But the point of it is you have to get out uh, much closer to one in order to have an effect. That actually is intuitively understandable. You'll notice that if you're allowed truncation, see truncation uh, um, is very simple. You go through and you say, okay, I want these peas, I want these peas, I want these peas, I don't want these peas, I don't want these peas, and you just, the, the ones you don't want are destroyed, fed to the pigs, given to the birds, uh, ground into uh, pea flour or something. And you only save the ones that you want, which is really a very unreasonable way of doing natural selection. As the fact of the matter is, that some of those P's that are zeros could make it. And some of the P's that are ones aren't going to make it. So truncation selection is not as reasonable as probability selection. But what, it's, uh, what this says is that if you go to full probability selection, it's not going to do you any good until you get uh, probabilities of 0 0.1 or 1 that helping something one in one in a thousand cases just isn't enough. And even with partial truncation you can see that this makes a huge difference in the probability of being able to fix it. You see if you're allowed to select as far down as you want, well, you can be pretty sensitive. Although you're going to miss some because you have to choose, am I going to take the 10 to the minus fifth one? Am I going to take the 10 to the minus fourth one? Well, I better take the 10 to the minus fourth one. Well, that means the 10 to the minus fifth one can't be selected. That's what it boils down to. Well, in this particular case, it would be more like the 10 to the minus sixth one. But the numbers are... I think you can understand the principle. 
It is well known that pro under probability, that probability selection corresponds most closely to what occurs in nature. Under probability selection, the probability of an individual's reproduction is directly proportional to that individual's phenotypic fitness. Under this type of selection, even individuals with relatively low phenotypic fitness still have some likelihood of reproducing. Probability selection contrasts strongly with truncation selection, for which all individuals above a specific phenotypic fitness value have 100% probability of reproduction, while all, all individuals below that probability have zero probability of reproduction. Full truncation selection never happens in nature. Partial truncation is intermediate. In this experiment, partial truncation that they're using is an exact 50-50 blending of classical probability selection and full truncation selection. Even with that, you can see it makes a huge difference. Figure three shows that in introducing even a modest degree of probability selection, partial truncation, results in markedly higher ST sub B values. The ST sub B value for partial truncation selection is uh, 2.54 times 10 to the minus fourth compared with 1.68 times 10 to the minus sixth for the, uh, for the uh, full truncation. Uh, full probability selection, the actual mode of selection happening nature led to a complete breakdown of selection of the entire range of mutational effects considered in the experiment, the maximal beneficial effects being 0.001. Once you get to numbers like 1, then it does start to show up. This indicates that ST sub B must have been greater than 0.01. Effects of high mutation rate and, subs and consequent selection interference among beneficial mutations. We then conducted a series of experiments still using truncation and selection and zero environmental variance, but with higher beneficial mutation ra ratios, ranging, we were talking about one originally, ranging from five to 40. As mutations accumulate, there arises a type of biological noise associated with selection interference among the mutations. Figure four summarizes a series of experiments that reveal increasing the rate of beneficial mutations led to higher selection thresholds. This means that as mutation rate increases, more and more of the alleles that otherwise would be selectable escape selection, which is kind of understandable. The idea is that if you've got 40 of them now, which ones do you choose? Well, some of them that you would have liked to have kept are going to be left by the wayside. We've got to select more on the basis of the ones that are higher in probability. Well, that has a, uh, an effect of probably one order of magnitude. So it's, it's there. Um, effective extremely beneficial mutations. Until this point, we have ex employed a ceiling value of 0 0.01 or beneficial mutational fitness effects. The rationale for this choice is given in the discussion section and was employed because very high impact mutations need to be handled separately. We therefore conducted experiments with higher maximal fitness effects up to 1.0. What does 1.0 mean? You're going to explain. When homozygous, a single beneficial mutation with a fitness value effective 1.0 will double the fitness of any individual relative to the initial fitness value. They produce twice as many kids. We find that the inclusion of mutations with fitness values of 0 0.1 or greater have such a profound effect on the behavior of the whole population that we refer to them as extremely beneficial mutations. As can be seen in figure five, which we'll see, when we repeated the experiment illustrated in figure one, but merely extended the upper range of beneficial mutation effects up to 1.0, the result was a very dramatic increase in the STB, uh, ST sub B value, 10 to the minus 3. This was a single factor in our studies that by itself most dramatically increased the beneficial selection threshold. And here is, you see it's shifted all the way to about 0, 0.0, what, about 0 0.02 or so. This is a logarithmic scale. Um, 
Compare that with the original, which was way off here at 10 to the minus sixth, and stopped it, uh, before, in other words, this is actually beyond the range of the other. What it means is you've got a variable that doubles the, the uh, birth rate. Other beneficial mutations almost don't matter at that point. If it's got that mutation, it'll survive. If it doesn't have that mutation, it'll gradually decrease in the, in the general population. Effective adding deleterious mutations. Now we're going to throw both of them together. Well, here's what happens. The deleterious mutations that they've thrown in give you an E of, of uh, 1 E 10 to the minus 5 to where it stops selecting them. In other words, this is no selection at all. They just accumulate. Um, whereas, you don't start collecting the positive mutations until you get to e to 10 to the 1, e 10 to the minus 6. That's an increase of 1 in a million, more or less, in the amount of kids you have. There's uh, modest levels of noise with a larger population. And uh, we're going to move on to the discussion. Uh, <coughs> this analysis leaves no doubt that there must be a very significant selection threshold for beneficial mutations in higher organisms. This threshold is not a simple function of population size, but is affected by numerous factors. There's substantial room for discussion regarding which parameter choices would be most appropriate for a given species. I would say also in a given environment, and which choices would be most representative of a given natural circumstances. However, if we use extremely conservative estimates for all the relevant parameter choices that affect th selection threshold, we should be able to estimate reasonably well the lower limits for mammalian ST sub B values. The experiment summarizes in figure 10 and 11 does just this yielding an ST sub B value of approximately 10 to the minus 3. That is, so mutations that, are less, that are, give you less than 1 in 1,000 extra babies, or 3 in 1,000 uh, extra babies, are not selectable. We have found that whenever we combine multiple sources of noise, even when using even our most conservative parameter settings, we see ST sub B values in this range. Therefore, we would suggest that 10 to the minus 3 is a reasonable approximation of the beneficial selection threshold for a typical mammalian population. The problem with selection interference has been casually recognized in several earlier papers, but no attempt has been made to quantify its effect under realistic circumstances, and the problem has largely been dismissed. Our studies suggest that selection interference is extremely important and cannot be properly understood except by using biologically reasonable, realistic genetic accounting programs, such as Mendel's accountant. This approach appears to bring the greatest clarity to the problem of selection interference and provides an excellent research tool for those who wish to study the problem further. We like our program. Can low-impact beneficial mutations contribute to genome building? Building genomes without the use of low-impact nucleotides is very problematic. Since the time of Darwin, it has been commonly thought that evolution must occur through an endless series of minuscule improvements, that is, one nucleotide at a time. In light of our findings, this does not appear feasible. Darwinism doesn't work. If beneficial mutations with the fitness effect of less than 0.1% are not selectable, then evolution must advance, only advance, via larger and more discrete steps. Can high impact beneficial mutations explain the origin of the genome? Well, maybe it's all these high impact mutations. A very high impact beneficial mutation, an extremely beneficial mutation, can obviously contribute to genome building, but only in a very limited sense we can see huge leaps in fitness scores, yet this improvement is entirely dependent 
upon only a handful of isolated, unlinked, non-complementary mutations. Under these conditions, selection can at best eliminate the worst deleterious mutations while amplifying only the highest impact beneficial mutations. Extremely beneficial mutations undoubtedly play a, an important role in adaptation to specific environmental circumstances, as in the case of microbial resistance to antibiotics, or the case of human resistance to malaria. However, beyond this type of dramatic adaptation to some lethal external factor, extremely beneficial mutations seem to have very limited explanatory power in terms of genome building. Can equal but opposite compensating mutations stop degeneration? The kind that was discussed, I think it was by Ono. One implication of high selection threshold for beneficial mutations is that ono, OTA, it's not ONO, it's OTA, OTA's hypothesis of compensating mutations does not appear viable. A multitude of low impact deleterious mutations cannot syst be systematically compensated by selection for equal but opposite beneficial mutations at other sites in the genome because they don't come that way. Our analysis indicates that selection thresholds for beneficial mutations are comparable in amplitude to those for deleterious mutations. So equal but opposite beneficial mutations must be equally unselectable, rendering such a stabilizing mechanism inoperative. The whole thing is rusting out, and there's nothing you can do about it. Possible criticisms. A possible criticism of this study might be that no one really knows the exact distribution of beneficial mutations. Therefore, some might claim that the y bull distribution we used in these studies may be distorting our conclusions about election threshold for beneficial mutations. However, our results do not depend on the precise shape of the distribution curve. As long as the distribution is approximately exponential, which would be a y bull uh, distribution, we get similar results and reach the same basic conclusions. A second possible criticism of this study might be that our thesis is contradicted by a large volume of scientific literature that uses DNA sequence in comparisons to infer historical positive selection events for great numbers of putative beneficial mutations. You see, it didn't used to have this beneficial mutation, and now it does, therefore, uh, Therefore, we must be able to select for beneficial mutations. To the extent that the theory and actual observations conflict, there arises a scientific paradox which demands a re-examination of either the standing theory or the observed data, or both. When I was trained in science, they said the data prompts theory. We naturally acknowledge the operation of selection for beneficial mutations in the past, but argue that such selection is severely constrained by the reality of selection threshold, as this study and common sense both demand. Natural selection, as presently understood, is simply cannot do what so many are attributing to it, at least relative to low-impact mutations, positive or negative. It is noteworthy that a significant part of this study of a part of this body of literature that claims proof of positive selection in the past, based on observed sequence variability in the present, may suffer from systemic error and is now being challenged. A third possible criticism of the study might be that our results are unique to our program, and therefore this program was specifically designed to give these results, and so it doesn't really match uh, other programs. Well, actually match biology so it really counts, but whatever. Yet in truth, we went to great lengths to design Mendel to best reflect biological reality, and it is in fact clear that Mendel's accountants is the most biologically realistic forward time population genetic numerical simulation yet developed. Furthermore, apart from specific details, our observations are in good agreement with what sound population genetics and logic would predict, and our work reflects an expansion, not a reversal of previous studies. Moreover, in another paper in these proceedings, and also in a separate paper, it is shown that the digital genetic simulation program known as AVIDA 
produces very similar results. Now, this is somebody else's genetics program. Similar results regarding selection threshold and selection breakdown, as we report here, when AVIDA is run using realistic fitness effects. In fact, AVIDA shows selection thresholds substantially worse than what we report here. Concluding comments. Our findings raise a very interesting theoretical problem. In a large genome, how do millions of low-impact yet functional nucleotides arise? It is universally agreed that selection works very well for high-impact mutations. However, unless some new and as yet undiscovered process is, is operating in nature, there should be selection breakdown for the great majority of mutations that have small impact on fitness. We have now shown that this applies both equally to both beneficial and deleterious mutations, and we have shown that selection interference is especially important when there are high impact beneficial mutations. That is, nothing else gets selected. We conclude that only a very small fraction of all non-neutral mutations are selectable within large genomes. Our results reinforce and extend the findings of earlier studies. While, which in general employed many simplifying exceptions and rarely included more than a single source of biological noise. We show that selection breakdown is not just a simple function of population size, but is seriously impacted by other factors, especially selection interference. We are convinced that our formulation and methodology, that is a genetic accounting, provides the most biologically realistic analysis of selection breakdown to date. And then there's a section on methods, and there's this, an appendix that it justifies the parameter settings that they used. And I'm not going to go on further on that. My own take on this is that this study looks at the ability of positive selection to power advancing evolution, not only under ideal conditions, but under more biologically realistic conditions. As might be expected, natural selection is relatively powerless to give the noted results. This is particularly telling, at least in my opinion, in cases such as the peacock's tail eyes. You know, there's all those ocelli, the peacock's tail flips the tail up and all those eyes are staring at you. Where multiple mutations are probably involved, multiple minimally helpful mutations, none of which can improve fitness significantly. Their, their value for producing fitness is probably 0 .00001 or something like that. Uh, in fact, there's some evidence that the peahens are not particularly impressed by the eyes. The eyes are for us. And where truncation selection seems unrealistic, can you imagine the peahen going, oh, the eyes are off-center, forget that guy. But he's got a great cry. The only answer to this argument I can see is that we have obviously gotten here, so there must be something wrong with the calculations. <laughs> now, this argument assumes that evolution happened as usually theorized. It's vulnerable if that assumption is not secure. So I think these guys are onto something. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. <coughs> Ariel. Um, do they give any example of uh, high impact mutations here? Is, uh, Resistance to antibiotics, what they'd call anti uh, high impact? Well, yeah, or, or perhaps the resistance of humans to malaria. You have something that allows a human to live in a malarious area. Uh, be it G6PD deficiency or sickle cell trait mm -hmm. or a number of other things like that. Those, that's a high impact mutation. Okay. 
Could you say a little more about the, the nature of his experiment? Are these computer experiments? The, are these b bacteria? What, what's going on here? These are, these are com uh, computer experiments. Uh, this is actually taking numbers and putting them in and, and saying, well, if <coughs> something improves the reproduction rate by one in 1,000 or one in one million, well, you know, the difference between 1 and 1. 1.000001 is so small that random effects completely swamp that, whether it be positive or negative. And basically, things that are that small in their impact are not selectable. Are, are there, is this kind of research does it typically then compare these computer results with actual uh, real-world data? The only place that I know of where that's been done is an article by these guys that some of you may remember, uh, uh, John Sanford showing the numbers on, uh, on uh, what happened to H1N1 flu. Uh, and it's fascinating because rather than getting worse and worse, it's finally petered out. And the only place you have to worry about getting H1N1 flu is from uh, uh, a corpse that's been frozen in the Yukon in 1918. Then you're in trouble. But H1N1 flu, for practical purposes, isn't there. We don't vaccinate it against it anymore. It's gone. Did, does he What's publish these things in peer-reviewed journals? Uh, this is, of course, in the book, partly because uh, peer-reviewed journals weren't really happy about ha having this. <coughs> um, uh, in fact, uh, the, the Darwin bots, as you may remember, actually shut down the publication of this by uh, Springer Verlag, who were happy to do it at the time. Now, this is engineering stuff, and engineers and computer scientists, they're happy to do this kind of thing. Um, but uh, Darwinian evolutionists don't want, they don't want the discussion started. I think because they know that once the discussion is started, they lose. I noticed that the uh, basis of computations was an uh, off offspring level of six, and I wondered if that was totally arbitrary or was that the average of uh, population of, of offspring in the universe, or, and, and if it would be raised or lowered, how much that might affect the results? Uh, well, of course, if you raise it or lower it, yes, it affects the results quite a bit. Uh, if you lower it, it becomes, uh, especially if you lower it, it becomes, uh, the wild type becomes unselectable. The, that was actually chosen because of the decreased number of, uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to have the wild type survive. So in order to do that, you have to have, for each two parents, you have to have two wild type kids on the average, at least. And they assumed that there was one mutation that counted at all uh, on the average per kid, which means that one over E of them would have one mutation, one over E of them would have zero mutations, and a s one minus those two would have t two or more mutations. And one over E turns out, if you multiply one over E by six, you get 2.2 kids that will have no, no mutations. So they said, okay, you can have six kids and we kill four of them. That's maximum truncation selection. And so with that setup, they can keep the wild type alive because each, each parent produces 2.2 kids on the average. and means that you can keep 
wild type going forever. Mm -hmm. And you can, with the proper selection, you can get rid of deleterious uh, mutations. Now what you can't do is you can't magnify all these little tiny things that need to be added up to make these beautiful eyes. That it has to be gross stuff, either grossly deleterious, in which case you can select it away, or grossly helpful, in which case you can uh, select for it. Uh, by the way, this really happens. There is a Darwinian reason why in the Arctic the bears are white, the foxes are white, the ptarmigans are white. That's not just chance. That's natural selection. But it's instructive to look at that <laughs> and note a couple of things. One of them is producing white bears turns out to be quite easy. You knock out their melanin. Basically, they're albino bears. Well, as you'll find out, there's more than one um, melanin pathway in the, in the body. And so you can have people with, let's say, uh, <coughs> blue eyes versus brown eyes. Um, uh, so conceivably, you could have you know, dark-eyed bears that are white uh, hair. <laughs> and in fact, you don't actually knock out all of the melanin in the, in the bears, because as I understand it anyway, the skin is black. It's just the fur on top of it that's not. So you didn't knock out all of the melanin. You just knocked out the melanin that went into the hair. <clears throat> but you see, once you have that mutation, it's so much easier to sneak up on a seal if he thinks you're a cloud instead of a, uh, instead of a large brown animal bearing down on him. Yes? A question on the, uh, the effects on malaria. Uh, sickle cell anemia is far more detrimental to the bear uh, it may, and it does, help in the uh, malaria, but all other indications, it's, it's very detrimental. So in terms of a, a population uh, extension or growth, it, it would not prove true at all, would it? No, it, it's difficult to call that in advance. Yeah. Um, we may eventually get an advance, but so far, all of our anti-malarial mutations have turned out to be knock something out. And the polar bear's adaptation for a white environment turns also out to be knock something out. And the point of it is, you don't get those beautiful eyes by knocking stuff out. You have to create them using a little mutation here, a little mutation there, a little mutation there, somewhere else that all happen to dovetail into, well, let's finally get, you know, gold in this area and blue in that area, <coughs> black in that area, and so forth. Mm -hmm. It takes a tremendous amount of coordination, and there isn't enough selective power to make it work. Yes, and then over here. Could you just put one of those truncation graphs up again and explain a little more for those of us who are not computer experts? Sure. Um, <coughs> yeah, one of those. This, this, I think, I, I, let's see, this is the one that you're talking about? Your first one is any one of them is fine. Um, uh, let's see if I can. There. Okay. Now, this is truncation selection in a kind of a standard way. Okay, which means what? Which means that your population has six kids apiece. You look them over and say, I don't want those four. <coughs> Off with their heads. 
or, or sterilize them, it doesn't matter. I mean, whichever, you know, works. Uh, that's truncation selection. And it's done on, a, if you like, an intelligent design. This is how we try to do, you know, for raising dogs, and we're trying to get, you know, a nice long snout, run, fast running ability, and so forth. That's how we do it. You know, those four puppies, well, they can go to the general population. These ones we're keeping with our greyhound bunch. See, that's truncation selection. These ones we want, these ones we don't. Um, this one is half the time getting truncation selection and the other half the time just, you know, whichever puppies happen to grow. And this blue one that goes out to here and then out a little farther out and then finally comes up is the one where you say, well, you know, if the puppies make it fine, if the puppies don't make it, whatever. <coughs> and of course, the sick puppies, you know, eventually don't make it or at least don't leave as many descendants. But it's a probability thing. It's not, it's not you're sitting there and doing this is where I draw the line. And yeah, what's the specific meaning of that, of that upward curve right there? Right? What this means is that if you have a whole bunch of different kinds of mutations, that when you get out to there, uh, you don't have enough selection power to select for everything. So you can only select for ones that are, you're sensitive enough to. And what this means is with, this, with the distribution that they were using, you can't really select for <coughs> mutations that, are, that, are, that give you more than one in a million extra kids. That is, instead of two million kids, you have two million and two. That's what that one E minus six means. Well, you see, if you can pick and choose, you can get pretty sensitive, one in a million. If you're not allowed to pick and choose, if you're just, you know, let the puppies grow and whatever comes out, comes out. Uh, if you're allowed to select a little bit, well, you know, hey, these ones look pretty interesting. Let's give them a little extra advantage. Uh, then you can get something that starts to select it will attend to the minus four. If you just allow the puppies to grow, it, nothing, nothing shows until you get to, you know, <coughs> point oh, uh, until you get a 2% uh, extra puppies or something like that. So, so what, what the vertical axis is saying is My fractional right. mutational accumulation. That's right. What this means is that this, this bunch of puppies gives you twice as many puppies as the as the standard set this is where you where you where you start doubling and it actually it's twice as many puppies in 10,000 generations it's not even twice as many puppies period uh, i mean per generation you ju you just start to get some effect um, yes and yes uh, obviously, uh, this is a, a very difficult situation for evolution here. Under these circumstances, and a uh, major part of the uh, animal and plant kingdom probably would fall under this, but when you come to bacteria, for instance, and you don't care how many uh, you lose along the way, what does this do to these statistics here? Well, um, what happens is the bacteria reproduce fast enough and with few enough errors in their, muta in their repair rate that you can actually keep something like this going. Uh, but if the mutation rate reaches above 50%, then you have what is known as Mueller's ratchet, which means that at that point they start actually going downhill because there aren't enough of the wild type that continue to survive. 
and most of the mutations are, are deleterious. So you start getting bacteria that start losing abilities as time goes on. What, what ratio did they use for beneficial to deleterious mutations here uh, in considering this? Did they, well, uh, did they, did they uh, talk about, wasn't it something like uh, when he talked about it at first, wasn't there a ben uh, ratio there that you gave? Well, okay, originally they were just considering beneficial mutations all by <coughs> themselves. Yeah. What was that? Uh, but eventually they said, well, supposing that, you know, half of them are beneficial and half of them are uh, when they did the combined one. Uh, yeah, extremely optimistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. If you put in numbers that actually correspond to reality as opposed to um, numbers that correspond to what people would like to believe, I mean, uh, the numbers don't come out. And what they're pointing out is that that's not just a function of their computer program. It's a function of AVID as well. It's a function of any uh, any any simulation be it pure mathematical or computer oriented, any simulation that reasonably approximates biological reality. Things are going downhill and they're not coming back. On, on this graph here, um, just from my own understanding, on partial truncation selection, you have, you have um, for truncation selection, it's not like it goes up exponentially and stays there, but for partial, it goes up and comes back down. I was wondering what that story is. I rather think that that's actually a, a, uh, an artifact, um, that if you were to run this multiple times, that it would actually, uh, this part might smooth, come up a little bit higher, that part might go down, it would probably <coughs> curve up there, and this, this is, uh, this is because the statistics are so small that that random number effects start to start, start to give you a, something crazy on it. The point of it is that if you actually have to depend on on the uh, survivability as opposed to somebody sitting there and doing an artificial truncation, if you have to depend on actual survivability that even out to one in a thousand, it, it, it doesn't help you. Now, I, the truth of the matter is I think that they created the program, they created it as well as they could, and then they started playing with it and they said, these are interesting numbers, and we should start explaining to people what those numbers mean and so basically they created the two papers. And the two papers tell you between the two of them that uh, the, the qualitative and semi-quantitative arguments that were used in genetic entropy, in fact, work in a computer model. That's what, basically what this is telling you is genetic entropy is, is a real fact of life. And of course, that has interesting implications for how long have we been here. And it has interesting implications for how long has life been here. And has God been subsidizing that life? Or perhaps did he not really create it that long ago? And it has been decaying, as we expect. And that those mm -hmm. of us who, you know, uh, that we're not as intelligent as our forebears, and that we're not as um, strong or as uh, anything else. And that the illusion that we have that humanity has been getting better <coughs> has more to do with environment than it does with heredity. That is, we're not mm -hmm. really getting better. We just are feeding ourselves mm -hmm. better. And that's why the size has gone up, let's say, in Europe from the Middle Ages where the 
where the suits of armor are built nicely for people who are five feet tall. It's, it's not just uh, Stan, Sanford and this group who are saying this. This I've seen this uh, with a crow paper way back in, in 2001. Yeah, so yeah. They, they've started this thing. Uh, uh, <coughs> they know there's a problem here. Yeah, they know it's a problem. Not only that, <coughs> but there's, some, uh, there, there's people who have noted that our general intelligence uh, level has gone down. That's not uh, hard to see. Uh, anyway, um, those of you who are able to, I come back next week and we'll uh, discuss more of the uh, material in the book and hopefully it will be um, a bit of an eye-opener as well. Uh, and eventually we'll go on to design detection and eventually I plan to, if I can ever get through reading Lactantius and, and Cosmos Indical Plutus, so that I know what I'm talking about. I plan to go back to the uh, firmament and uh, and uh, the ancient Hebrew picture of what space was like. Rakia. The Rakia. Anyway.